Brianna, what's on your radar? Well, Robbie, as we covered yesterday on the show, Tulsi Gabbard, former representative for Hawaii's 2nd Congressional District, announced that she was leaving the Democratic Party. Now, mainstream corporate Democrats had a predictable response. For example, activist Charlotte Clymer, uh, journalist Dan Rather, and dozens of others tweeted some version of Kel Surprise, alluding to a perceived shift by Tulsi toward conservative news sources and talking points over the course of the last couple of years. Leftists tended toward a more substantive critique, pointing out, as Ben Norton of The Gray Zone did, that while the Democratic Party is deeply neoliberal and pro-imperialist, calling it anti-white, as she did in her viral announcement video, is, quote, absurd right-wing culture war nonsense. But Norton's most important point, and the one I want to focus on, is his next one. The problem isn't that Gabbard is wrong about the Democratic Party. It is imperialist. It is corrupt. However, the problem is that without a similarly robust critique of the neoliberal corporate Wall Street Republicans, she's simply co-opting a genuine anti-war concern to sheepdog genuinely anti-war voters toward a party that has no intention of, well, stopping endless wars. This is a disappointing turn. Like most leftists, I was introduced to Tulsi when she courageously resigned as vice chair of the DNC to support Bernie Sanders, citing her experience as a military veteran and the fact that she wanted the United States to avoid interventionist wars of regime change. Take a listen. The American people are faced with a very clear choice. We can elect a president who will lead us into more interventionist wars of regime change, or we can elect a president who will usher in a new era of peace and prosperity. It's with this clear choice in mind that I'm resigning as vice chair of the DNC so that I can strongly support Bernie Sanders as the Democratic nominee for president of the United States. But her anti-war stance rings somewhat hollow when she reserves no criticism for the war hawks in the Republican Party, too. For example, in May, after Congress passed $40 billion in aid for Ukraine, Gabbard tweeted her concern that, as Americans struggled with rising gas prices and inflation, Washington rushed to fund yet another endless war, a fair criticism in my book, and one which we've raised repeatedly on this show. But the overwhelming majority of Republicans in the House, all but 57 of them, voted for the $40 billion in Ukraine aid, and only 11 Republican senators out of 50, of course, voted against it. Certainly, certainly more Republicans and Democrats voted for the funding, including independent senator from Vermont, Bernie Sanders, who has been oddly silent on the escalations in the region and calls for peace from the left. Still, it's important to recognize that the, quote, permanent Washington establishment, as she describes it, is a dangerous bird that needs two wings to fly. Biden and the Democrats absolutely deserve criticism for using Raytheon as a recruiting ground for defense secretaries and for taking millions of dollars from the defense industry when running for office. But that's also true of Donald Trump and some of the top takers of defense contractor money are, in fact, Republicans. David Perdue of Georgia, Roy Blunt of Missouri, Susan Collins of Maine, and Rick Scott of Florida top the list, followed by Democrat Tom Carper from Biden's home state. According to a 2020 Sledge report, 51 members of Congress and their spouses own between $2.3 and $5.8 million of stocks in companies that are among the top 30 defense contractors in the world. The conflict of interest is obvious. More than 70% of Lockheed Martin's $51 billion in 2018 revenue came from sales to the U.S. government, and nearly one-third of the members of the Senate Defense Subcommittee of the Appropriations Committee own stocks in top defense contractors. Simply put, when war happens, stocks go up. When Trump killed Iranian General Soleimani, dozens of members of Congress saw their portfolio value bump due to the possibility of war. War quite literally pays for the people we expect to keep the peace. But those people, those guilty parties, are in both political camps. The solution to this war profiteering may very well involve leaving the Democratic Party. I certainly left it a long time ago. But I am not so naive as to believe that the Republican Party, with its open courtship of weapons manufacturers, is the solution. 
Perhaps more puzzling about Tulsi's pivot is that her allusion to culture wars as a motivation for her departure is a little out of place. On one level, I understand this too. Part of my choice to distance myself from Democrats was my belief that they weaponized identity and representational politics to avoid dealing with the material economic concerns so many working people, white, black, brown, Asian alike, are struggling with. But the point of that critique is to help working people not to invest in a different kind of right-wing identity politics, where fears about a war on religion or a war on white people are simply replacements for the Democrats' identity politics wars. Tulsi wrote, quote, I can no longer remain in today's Democratic Party that is now under the complete control of an elitist cabal of warmongers driven by cowardly wokeness who divide us by racializing every issue and stoke anti-white racism, actively work to undermine our God-given freedoms enshrined in our constitution, are hostile to people of faith and spirituality, demonize the police and protect criminals at the expense of law-abiding Americans, and on and on and on. Like, I strongly object to any politics that diminishes the struggles of working class and poor white Americans, like all Americans. I've argued to editorial boards where I've worked in the past that they should cover midterm elections from the perspective of who is best meeting the needs of the opioid crisis, and which disproportionately, although not exclusively, harms white folks. I think it's a tragic reality that life expectancy has declined for white Americans, and that my generation is the first to take a step back from the American dream. At the same time, however, I push for an inclusive message that affirmatively values all Americans, even if at times it's necessary to specifically call out prejudices that rear their heads against specific groups, whether it's the white supremacist attacks on Jewish people during Charlottesville or at the Tree of Life massacre, or whether it's the Buffalo shooting which targeted black Americans, or the Uvalde shooting in a Latino community that targeted children. Is there a space to critique all kinds of bigotry in Tulsi's vision or just anti-white racism? I, I truly don't know, and this is a question I'm genuinely curious to see the answer to, and which I think Tulsi should try to answer in the coming days and weeks. Moreover, I'd like to hear from her what constitutes demonizing the police. Is it wrong to, say, criticize their ineptitude in Uvalde? The fact that increased funding, including under the Biden administration, hasn't actually led to lower crime. If I agree with the majority of LA conservatives that I support reallocating parts of LAPD's budget to social workers, mental health care, and other social services, is that demonizing the police? Does this reallocation, sometimes referred to as defunding, seem less like demonizing the police when I point out that according to this recent Marymount poll, support for reallocating the police budget to social services is higher among people who live with a cop than people who don't? Look, Tulsi is right when she writes that the pro-war Democratic Party has led us to the brink of nuclear war, but it didn't do it alone. Tulsi is poised to make a powerful statement against our two-party duopoly, and if she does, calling out both parties for their choice to weaponize the security state and federal law enforcement, not just for political reasons, but to oppress the poor who languish disproportionately in our country's overfull prisons, she could be a powerful positive force in this country. If she talked about how the IRS overtargets poor people who are easy to audit, rather than going after the rich, partly because they are insufficiently staffed and funded to do so, it would strengthen her critique of that agency. For all of the culture war bluster in her Substack post, the word poor shows up zero times. The word working, as in working people or working class, it shows up exactly once. I humbly submit that what America needs is not another culture warrior. What made Tulsi admired by many across the political spectrum in the first instance was her commitment to speaking hard truths about the military industrial complex and taking politically inconvenient stands that lost her powerful friends. Exchanging one elite party for another would seem to defeat the point. As one leftist YouTuber wrote, leaving the Dems for the GOP is like leaving Cherry Coke for Classic Coke. Are we looking for something substantively different or just a new flavor of gas? Bernie, the guy Tulsi once gave up her DNC position for, is too quiet on Ukraine.
but he hasn't stopped foregrounding the needs of working people, catching flack from the establishment after he criticized the Democrats for focusing so much of their midterm advertising on abortion to the exclusion of economic issues that polls show majorities still prioritize. Will Tulsi champion working people in that way? Will she foreground talk of a minimum wage, a wealth tax, health care for all, all policies she once backed as a Bernie delegate? The Lever just reported that 12 years after the ACA, big insurers are getting most of their money from the government and have jacked up prices by nearly 24%. Do issues like that matter at least as much as a war on religion that, by the way, no one has hardly defined, much less proposed a solution to? Our profit-based medical system is so cruel that children's beds are being replaced by more lucrative adult beds in hospitals across the country. Is that at least as big a priority as passing laws to keep trans middle schoolers from playing on the sports team of their choosing? Look, even if you agree that Democrats are trying to divide us up, are you so confident that your rhetoric isn't doing the same? Mm. I think that, that's the fundamental question. I'm really beyond trying to convince anybody that they you know, should or shouldn't care about any given issues. My only concern is whether or not people are prioritizing the things that actually materially affect their life or if they're falling for the traps that some culture warriors on both sides of the aisle try to set to obscure the extent to which people who are running our country, people who are at the top of both political parties, the elites, which know no political bias, they're everywhere in both parties at the top, are trying to keep you from noticing that you're getting a smaller and smaller share of the pie. Not because of each other, but because of the policies she, that they're setting. But she didn't announce, she only announced that she's leaving the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. She has not actually joined the Absolutely. Republican Party. So, you know, while I, I guess I, I agree with you that the Republican Party deserves criticism for various things and, uh, you know, that it, people should denounce them as well, um, she, she has not yet said, maybe that's going to change, but she hasn't said, this is everything I like about the Democratic Party, so I'm like I'm joining the Republican Party because I like it better. Maybe she'll join the Libertarian Party. Maybe she'll join the Forward Party. Maybe she'll just remain an independent who, you know, picks and chooses aspects of the parties that she agrees with. Yeah, you know, what it comes down for me, I mean, her fundamental. I, I I think of her as most fundamentally defined by her opposition to nation building. That she was this crusading figure on that. On that issue, that was why she, I mean, that, in that clip you played, mm -hmm. that's what drove her decision making mm -hmm. in, uh, if we go back to 2016. And, and look, if, if that is, if that is the, if your focus, I mean, it is the case that the Democratic Party, more than the Republican Party, yeah, the Republican Party is failing this test too, but the Democratic Party is the ones in charge on this, and they are much, they're more in lockstep on, um, on a foreign policy that is, that is sadly and unfortunately antithetical to that. I think it's an indictment of Joe Biden, who it, it seemed a little bit, maybe, like he got it more than Donald Trump or Barack Obama or you know, any of our previous regimes that, that had pledged to end our, our, our commitments and our blunders. And he did do, he did it and won. the withdrawal from Afghanistan. But now, but now yeah. look at it. So Yeah, look, I, and I completely take that point. And, this, and this, I, know, this, I know you feel that way, is, obviously. This is part of what I'm getting at. It's yeah. like, if, if she wants people to credit her and take her in good faith, which frankly, most people who aren't Republicans don't take her in good faith on this, at this point, this is why. And it is suspicious. Look, if I sit here and say, uh, I hate Max. Macs are terrible computers, blah, 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 blah. The impl obvious oh, implication Max? is Who's that Max? I think what did Apple see? computers. App, got it, gotcha. Got <laughs> the, the obvious implication, I'm sorry, I'm an old head. That's what we used to call them in the 90s. <laughs> but the, the obvious implication is that I think PCs are better. You know, mm -hmm. we, we reason by inference all the time. Oh. And I think that there is a slippage here that is not accidental. Now, maybe that's unfair, and there's plenty of time to correct that. I would love to see her throw her support behind an independent third party, because that means that you have a real sincere criticism of what's causing the system to be spoiled. But you cannot, I'm sorry, you, I mean, you're right that the Democrats, as I said on my radar, the Democrats voted more for the Ukraine funding, but when 57 out of the 200 odd Republicans in the House still uh, are the only ones who objected and the overwhelming majorities of, of Republicans voted for it, when only, what was it, 10 or 11 uh, Republicans in the Senate didn't vote for that same package, what you're looking at as is a, a, a systemic problem. And the fact that there are a couple of Republicans who are doing the right thing on this one issue cannot be used as a solve for the Republican Party well, any more than Bernie Sanders or a couple of squad members being halfway decent on some things is a reason to forgive the Democratic Party for all of My it. My sense is there is more genuine opposition to 
continuing to fund the Ukraine effort in, in conservative media more broadly, in sort of conservative politics, and that there is not nearly to that degree within the Democratic coalition. I mean, like putting uh, putting the Ukraine flag in your bio is a yes. Democratic personality yes. right now. That but doesn't that, exist that on the Republican side. That has no side. bearing on the systemic critique of the fact that both parties are being able to hide behind that yeah, reality sure. and take money hand over fist, trade stocks for, on these defense contractors, and laugh all the way to the bank while having the veneer of, oh, well, at least we're better than the other guy. That vote blue no matter who, vote red no matter who, that's what's causing all of these people to be, get, be able to get away with this sort of thing. And it would be wonderful if Tulsi Gabbard actually uh, continued the independent streak that people loved her for well, and was willing to call out the elites, where, whatever the, the letter is behind their name. Well, again, we would love to have her on the show. I would love to facilitate this discussion between the two of you, so we'll see if we can make that happen. We'll have more Rising after this. Stay with us.